Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to yet another 40k lore video in which we will be taking a look at Tau Battle Suits. Now, Battle Suits in and of themselves are a fairly unique invention to the Tau Empire. The Imperium does have its knights, of course, and various other factions have developed um, similar type equipment, I suppose you could say, but the Tau's own philosophy of maneuver warfare and firepower has created a rather unique well, vehicle, I suppose we should call them, in the Tau battle suit. Now, first up, what is the point, so to say, of the Tau battle suits? Why are they created? Why do they exist? And why have they become such an integral part of the Tau army? Well, the answer to that is simply that they fulfill a vital role within the Tau Hunter cadre. They are units capable of transporting vast amounts of firepower and protection very quickly across virtually any and all terrain. They are able to get into advantageous positions and carry enough firepower and protection with them to make use out of said positions. Additionally, of course, they are extremely fast. They are easily capable of keeping a pace with the hovercrafts, or anti-grav crafts to be precise, of the rest of the Tau Hunter cadre they are assigned to. Additionally, they are considerably more maneuverable than a full-on anti-grav vehicle, as they are capable of entering virtually any and all terrain because they are bipedal machines. They can enter urban areas, rocky areas, and hilly areas, where anti-grav vehicles can in some cases not enter at all, as in the case of a heavily urbanized area, or would have to do so in a very vulnerable state. For example, a tower anti-grav vehicle can cross ravines, it can go up uh, heavily rocked slopes, etc., but to do so, it has to increase the feed to its anti-grav thruster, meaning it's going to have to hover further above ground, which of course makes it a considerably easier target both to spot and to hit, which is not ideal as Tau vehicles, although having very good protection in place for the pilot and crew of these vehicles, the vehicles themselves are not particularly tough. Odds are that the crew are going to survive, but the vehicle is most likely going to get wrecked by a direct hit by, uh, for example, Imperial Grade anti-tank weapons, laser cannons, battle cannons, that kind of stuff. And of course, with the exceptions of side-to-side uh, -side and forward and backwards movement, and very limited up and down movement, it takes quite a while to change the uh, pitch, so to say, of the anti-grav engine, it can essentially skip along the ground, but that's about it, and of course it's virtually impossible for the vehicle to actually fire accurately while doing this, which is not a recommended maneuver, although it has been documented on a few occasions in the lore. They don't have a whole lot of ways of dodging incoming fire, whilst a battle suit has all manners of ways of dodging fire. It could go ground base for short periods of time, uh, sprinting back and forth, uh, dodging to the sides, changing direction very quickly, using its just thrusters to maneuver even faster. It can launch itself into the air, it can boost itself back down to the ground, it can use rocket-propelled leaps to carry itself forward, backwards, to the sides, etc. Additionally, of course, it will be far easier for a battle suit to take full advantage of any available concealment and or cover than a full-on tank. And all of these advantages in maneuverability and speed do not really come at the cost of firepower, as Tau battle suits are capable of bringing along with them considerable amounts of whoopass if necessary. Their greatest weakness, if they could be said to have a weakness other than their limited numbers, is the fact that they are somewhat limited in the protection that they offer themselves and their pilots. A decent hit by any kind of anti-tank weaponry is almost certain to render the battlesuit inoperable. In fact, even heavy anti-infantry weaponry along the lines of heavy bolters and light plasma weapons pose a serious danger to battlesuits. However, the Tau pilots do not really consider this that much of a problem. Their philosophy is very straightforward. If they don't get hit, 
they don't need the protection, and they are maneuverable enough to avoid the majority of incoming fire, and they have enough targeting systems and heavy weapons to then destroy whatever is shooting at them before whatever it is really gets a proper grasp on the battlesuit's maneuverability and its capabilities and thereby adjust its fire. This makes the battlesuits incredibly potent weapons when used in planes or when they have the advantage of surprise that they will more often than not be able to locate and eliminate any enemies firing at them before they can really get their eye in, so to say. However, the relatively weak armor does mean that if it does get hit before it gets to start maneuvering, it's usually in a very bad place, as such they are quite vulnerable to ambushes, however to counteract this, battle suits usually have fairly sophisticated sensor systems and are usually also accompanied by one or more drones capable of scouting ahead and keeping a bird's eye view of the area to make sure that that doesn't happen. Additionally, only relatively high-ranking Tau that have at least four years of active combat service behind them are allowed to pilot Tau battlesuits. As such, any battlesuit pilot is guaranteed to be a veteran of many, many engagements and has undergone rigorous training to teach him how to make the best use out of his battlesuit's armor, its weaponry and its maneuverability. And even if, as I have mentioned, the armor in and of itself is quite limited, it is also designed in such a way as to provide tons of sloped and slanted surfaces that can be used to deflect incoming fire rather than absorb it head on. And of course, maneuvering and positioning the battlesuit in such a way as to make maximum usage out of this design feature is entirely up to the pilot, so the better the pilot, odds are the tougher the suit. But now that we've talked a bit about the battlesuit in general, it's time we go through some of the variations and the history of the Tau battlesuit. Now, I will be covering most of them here. There are a few I will not cover too much since they don't have a whole lot of miniatures in the lore and because there's not really any proper documentation or pictures of them. They are mentioned essentially rather briefly, like for example the XV-46 Vanguard Void Battlesuit, which is, as the name suggests, a battlesuit specifically designed for operations in the void of space. More specifically, it is designed for ship boarding actions when this becomes unavoidable, as the Tau Empire has over the course of their history with the Imperium, realized that the Imperium has a tendency of liking boarding actions. And of course, for the exploration of space hulks. You see, the Tau have had some rather traumatizing experiences with space hulks, and they decided that rather than go through all of that nonsense all over again, it'd probably be better if they could intercept and effectively explore these massive hulks of destroyed ships and to root out the various nasties that live within them before they get close to populated worlds. But back to the point, the first battlesuits were used by the Tau during their first sphere expansion, when they were known as the T-Series, and one has to assume that they came in any colour you wanted, as long as the colour you wanted was black, where they helped capture the Tush Var system in 576 millennia 39. These early series, the T series, were fueled by fossil fuel, and was relatively quickly replaced by the V series, which was fueled by a fusion reactor. However, there was one tiny problem with this. Namely the fact that it kept irradiating the pilots and killing them off, which, um, you know, for a nation, or race more specifically, that does actually value the lives of its citizens, this was a little bit problematic, and it was not until later that they became a standard part of the Tau Cardos with the current X series of battlesuits, where most of the, uh, you know, radiation sickness had been relatively satisfactory solved. These days, battlesuits are used by virtually all hunter cadres in a variety of different missions and uh, roles. 
The most common of these battle suits is the XV-8 Crisis battle suit. This particular unit is designed primarily to be a very flexible frontline fighter and can be equipped with a variety of gear to have it fill all manners of battlefield roles. It can be a scout, it can be a rapid reaction unit, it can be a fire support unit, it can be a suppression unit, an ambusher, an assaulter, a maneuverable rear guard, it can be a reserve unit, it can be virtually anything that the Tau commander at the time requires it to be. And to do this, it has several more or less standardized loadouts. For example, there is one configuration of a Tower Battle Suit a Squad, which is called the Death Rain Configuration. It consists of three Chassouis, which are all piloting battle suits, all with twin linked missile pods with a, a drone controller and two gun drones for close uh, protection. In this configuration, the drone controller is used to spot the enemy forces and also to uh, guide the weapons, the uh, missiles in this case, onto the target, while the battle suits, while after having fired all of their missile pods, will essentially retreat from the battleground as quickly as possible, either to relocate and fire the remainder of their missiles to avoid you know, incoming counter-battery fire, or simply to retreat and reload their missile pods. There are a ton of other configurations, all based around specific objectives, tank hunting, anti-infantry, anti-horde, uh, suppression, scouting, etc, etc. The XV-8 is also usually the battle suits utilized by Tau battlefield commanders, and now we really start getting into silly variety land, as the Tau produce a wide variety of different suits specialized for different particular uh, roles and objectives, depending on the preference, essentially, of the battlefield commander. And can also often uh, essentially reflect his stature in the Tau Empire. For example, the XV-802 Crisis Iridium battle suit. This is a battlesuit made out of experimental iridium alloy armor, which is far tougher than normal armor, but also a fair bit heavier. This is to provide extra protection to Tower commanders after a um, particularly unfortunate event that led to the death of a certain commander Pride Star to a sniper's bullet with the subsequent rout of the Tau. This uh, was, of course, a problematic event for the Tau, as it meant that, well, if all it takes to uh, essentially put one of our battle carters to flight is killing the commander, that leaves us with a pretty considerable and relatively easy to exploit weakness. However, Iridium turned out to be ridiculously hard and expensive to produce, and as such, only a small series of these suits were actually created although a few septs are known to call upon them to protect their more prominent individuals. Other variants include the XV-801 Crisis Battlesuit with a smart missile firing system, or the XV-84 Crisis Battlesuit with a marker light and target lock, essentially a laser-guided system on its uh, back right there. Perhaps the XV-85 in a Forcer Battlesuit would be more suited to your needs. It is essentially a heavier battlesuit, but not quite to the point of the Iridium version. It provides extra protection, certainly, but uh, again, it is in the end just a battlesuit. It will probably be able to withstand a sniper's bullet as long as it is fired from, you know, a, a, um, a long lass or something along those lines. Oh, and by the way, that would be las bolt rather than bullet fired from the long lass. But something fired for um, a specialized sniper weapon, like those, for example, used by the Vindicar Temple, yeah, that's going to be a hell of a lot more problematic, as uh, those bullets are usually rather specialized. I mean, they even have bullets designed specifically to penetrate shielding, so, uh, yeah, a few centimeters of uh, alloyed metal is probably not going to protect you. And of course, the XV-86 Cold Star Battlesuit. Now, this one is quite interesting because it is designed primarily for speed and maneuverability rather than weapons or protection. The idea behind it being, of course, that a Tau Commander might have to be in several locations at once. 
a uh, well-known conundrum for many in leadership roles, I am sure, and having a vehicle capable of uh, traversing the battlefield extremely quickly is going to help with that particular conundrum. He might still not be able to be everywhere at once, but at least he will be able to be more places in a shorter period of time, lending his wisdom and battlefield experience to his troops. This is, of course, especially useful in the Tau way of war, which is usually extremely rapid, which means that uh, units in forward positions might very easily run so far ahead of the main command cadre that they might be out of direct communication. Of course, the Tau have many ways of communicating via radio or uh, laser signaling, but unfortunately their enemies also tend to have a way or two of blocking said forms of communication. Or, of course, you could go the completely opposite direction and use the XV-89 Crisis Battlesuit, and yes, I know, this is a hell of a lot of variations just for Commander's versions, and trust me, I am actually skipping a few variants here. Now, this version is used more or less for urban operations and close quarter combat missions where the commander simply cannot afford to stay far enough behind enemy uh, friendly, I mean, lines, to remain safe. As such, increased firepower and protection is far more valuable than speed. But, of course, these battlesuits do have some drawbacks, namely the fact that they are unable to carry the kind of heavy weaponry that might be needed to deal with uh, enemy heavy armor, etc. For this, the Tau have developed the XV-88 Heavy Battlesuit. Now, this one is um, quite different than the normal Crisis Battlesuit, Primarily because it sacrifices maneuverability for firepower and armor, where the XV-8 could definitely be said to sacrifice armor and firepower for more maneuverability. The XV-8 is essentially designed to avoid incoming fire, whilst the XV-88 is designed to weather incoming fire. Now, being the pilot of a vehicle that is expected to get hit, and hopefully survive getting hit, it does require a fairly cool and collect mindset, as such, only Chassui veterans who have gained sufficient experience in piloting the normal Crisis battlesuits are allowed to pilot the XV-88 battlesuits. These heavier battlesuits are armed with uh, considerably heavier armament than uh, the XV-8. Usually this consists of a twin-linked or a dual shoulder-mounted rail rifles, as well as a missile pod either in an over-the-shoulder position or in the hands. There are also variants uh, either armed with extra anti-tank weaponry or extra anti-infantry weaponry. This uh, latest variant was specifically designed to deal with orcs and Terranid threats, where there are not that many extremely heavy vehicles or bioorganisms on the battlefield, but there's going to be a lot of little gribbly ones. Now, as for the amount of protection offered by the XV-88, considering it is designed to weather rather than avoid enemy fire, it is quite substantial. Or at least it is substantial when it comes to protecting the pilot. You see, the Tau place a far greater value on the pilot rather than the battlesuit. And the design of the battlesuit itself means that it can be quite vulnerable to high explosives and anti tank weaponry, seeing as most of its weapon systems are, of course, mounted externally. A good hit by anything heavy is very likely to damage or incapacitate a lot of its weapon systems, but it is unlikely to kill the pilot. In fact, pilots have been known to survive direct hits from battle cannons and LAS cannons even when their suits have been made more or less inoperable. But of course, even in a suit like this that is not designed for maneuverability, getting hit really is the last resort option. Having to rely on the armor is never really ideal, and in the case of the XV-88, its best protection is its ability to get into good ambushing positions and kill its enemy before its enemy even knows it is there, or at the very least knock him out before he can return fire effectively. And being armed with the extremely effective railguns, this is usually not that much of a problem, and uh, seeing as the tower one of 
very, very few races out there that actually use smart missile technology, they can often engage enemy armor columns from behind hills or other forms of solid cover or concealment, thereby keeping themselves safe from the inevitable retribution. And lastly, before we move on to the bigger and uh, newer battlesuits, we need to take a look at the stealth battlesuits. Now, the objective of stealth battlesuits is rather self-explanatory. It is about being stealthy by being able to sneak up to the enemy and deliver large amounts of firepower before they know they're being hit, and then get the hell out of there before the enemy gets to shoot back. Now, the oldest version of this is the XV-15 stealth battlesuit. Essentially, it is a Fire Warrior-sized battlesuit, with a lot of extra sensor equipment and some enhanced fiber bundled muscles to allow it to carry a heavier weapon than the standard Fire Warrior. It is also a fair bit more clunky than just good old fashioned combat armor, but it does make up for this with its stealth field generator. This generator uses holographic images projected from various points around the armor to create a distorted image of the background, making the battlesuit very hard to notice. Although, it does have a weakness in that if it is uh, placed in bright light or against a very um, sheer backdrop, for example just a f white wall for example, it does become very obvious very quickly, but against foliage or something like that, it is very, very, very hard to spot. However, the XV-15s have been more or less completely surpassed by the newer XV-25s, which are larger, heavier, capable of carrying heavier weapons, and crucially, capable of carrying a lot more survival equipment, including a full medical suit and nutrient reservoirs. This allows the battlesuits to stay in the field for far longer periods of time than the XV-15, which enhances their abilities as scouts and infiltrators immeasurably. Additionally, they do provide the Ver a wee bit more armor, and they are capable of withstanding lasagun fire for a limited period of time, but they won't be protecting the wearer for any real amount of time against heavier or larger caliber small arms like um, Astati's Bolters, for example. The XV-15, by the way, provided about as much protection against Astati's Bolter fire as wet tissue paper, so even this is definitively an improvement. But primarily, the improvements comes in the form of having heavy weapons, the ability to mount a jetpack for increased maneuverability, and an improved stealth field generator. The new design of the suit allows it to blend in with the environment to a considerably greater degree than the earlier XV-15s. There's also a highly experimental suit by the name of the XV-22, used by the famous Tau Commander Shadow's Son during the Third Sphere expansion. The Earth cast hoped to introduce the XV-22 and Mars to replace the XV-15, however, the Kappa Mortis incident forced them instead to bring the easier to produce XV-25 into full-scale production. Which naturally brings up the question, what the hell is the Kappa Mortis incident, and why did it force the Tau in essentially compromising? They had to ditch more advanced technology for easier to produce technology. Well, you see, the Kappa Mortis incident was one of the last incidents during the Tau of Damocles Gulf Crusade, where a unit of ultramarine space marines managed to capture a XV-15 battle suit. This allowed the Imperium to reverse engineer a lot of the technology used within and counteract a lot of its effect to predictably detrimental consequences for the XV-15 users. Now, this essentially meant that the tower had two options. They could either pretty much completely and utterly forego the use of stealth suits for a very large period of time until the XV-22 stealth suits could be um, completed and mass-produced, which was considered unacceptable for the Tau, and so instead 
they started production of the XV-25 suits, which while being more advanced than the XV-15s, thereby being a hell of a lot uh, less vulnerable to the countermeasures designed against the XV-15, it was ready for immediate production. And while it wasn't as good, the Tau wanted something that was capable of stealth now, rather than something that might be capable of a better stealth sometimes in the future. But, of course, the Tau Earthcast does not like compromising, and so, instead of just building the XV-25s, they went on to create something rather remarkable. The XV-95 Ghost Keel. This massive and wondrous creature is by far the biggest and most powerful stealth suit designed by the Tau Empire to date. It is designed to infiltrate deep behind enemy lines and spread chaos and confusion by popping out of cover, laying down an absolutely ludicrous amount of firepower and then vanishing, disrupting reserve forces, supplies, headquarters operations, etc, etc. It does this via a system of stealth drones, rather than the usual stealth node generators. These drones are essentially highly advanced holographic emitters. They project an almost impossible to distinguish image of the background in front of the XV-95, making it virtually impossible to spot it, and since each XV-95 will have several of these drones, it is capable of covering itself from virtually every direction. Now, these suits are of course designed to operate behind enemy lines for extremely extended periods of time, as by far the most dangerous moment in XV-95's mission is whenever it is in motion, as I of course when it's moving, it gets considerably harder for its drones to continuously uh, show a convincing, so to say, image of its surroundings effectively, because of course it is in movement. This of course becomes infinitely more complicated when it's trying to sneak past battle lines. Now. To help the pilot out with this problem, the drones are not controlled so much directly from the pilot himself as it is from an AI, an artificial intelligence built into the suit. Now, the use of artificial intelligence is something that is almost unique to the Tau Empire, most of the other races in the galaxy, having had um, uncomfortable experiences with artificial intelligences. In fact, the 41st Millennium is one of those fantasy universes where AI will pretty much always come to the conclusion that whoever created it are douchebags and should probably be eradicated. You know, for the greater good, of course, which is the wonderful irony of this, and I do hope that the writers will take this all the way to its logical conclusion. But there is something far more fascinating, or should I say amusing, that I wanted to talk about at the XV-95. So, these suits have an AI inside of this. This AI is capable of speech, and is a relatively intelligent thing. It's nothing along the lines of the artificial intelligences of our modern days. This is an extremely sophisticated artificial intelligence. It is not stated anywhere whether or not it is self-aware, but it is clearly extremely sophisticated and even capable of holding conversations, etc to the point where XV-95 pilots often become extremely attached to their battle suits and become very antisocial and introvert, preferring the company of their AI partner, which undoubtedly they end up giving cutesy names and referring to as my waifu. Actually, I'd quite like one of these XV-95s, I wonder if I could somehow smuggle one out of the Tau Empire. Hmm. But fantasies of virtual girlfriends aside, let's move on to something a little bit more aggressive, shall we? One of the newest types of battlesuits is the XV-9 Hazard Close Support Armor, a newly introduced battlesuit used by the Tau Empire. This is the most sophisticated and powerful battlesuit to date. And considering we just looked at the XV-95, that is uh, quite saying something. But it's also a somewhat controversial battlesuit, because you see, it does not really 
go in accordance with the normal standards of Tau warfare. This is, as the name suggests, a close support armor. It is designed for very, very short-range combat. In fact, its primary means of operation is to use its very powerful jet thrusters to uh, boost itself right into the middle of enemy formations, where a team of usually three of these battlesuits will then lay down an absolutely ludicrous amount of firepower from its twin-linked burst cannons. Essentially, this would be like having a battlesuit equipped with quad miniguns. A fairly dreadful amount of firepower, I'm sure you will agree. However, it is also, of course, ridiculously risky, as these suits are literally designed to jump directly into enemy formations and decimate enemy infantry formations at extremely point-close range. In fact, literally point-blank range. This has, of course, led to some arguments that it is just plain wasteful, because these suits are considerably more complicated, expensive, and slow to produce than the XV-8 and XV-88 battle suits, which has led many people to argue, well, many Tau at least, to argue, that it is simply a waste of resources and that there is no need for such a battle suit. However, its pilots argue that it is a fantastic weapon for many, many battlefield purposes, and Naturally, I would actually agree. I mean, you have to consider the strategic advantages of having a weapon like this capable of literally bouncing straight into enemy formations, causing all manners of havoc and panic before then boosting away again. A pretty damn effective weapon, you would have to agree, both from a good old-fashioned boom-boom-bang standpoint and a psychological standpoint. On the other hand, of course, these suits are incredibly difficult to operate effectively, e.g. having the sheer brass balls to bounce directly into formations of enemy infantry, knowing exactly how long you can stay there to maximize your effectiveness before having to bounce out of there, before someone with a missile launcher or a heavy bolter takes an interest in your anus. As such, they are only used by veterans, Usually only by Tau with at least 8 years of service, with 4 years of those service already having been spent in other battle suits. Nevertheless, whichever side of the argument you might fall on, it is certainly a wonderful technological achievement, although it might to many appear as if the Tau is heading for a little bit of a... Um, World War II Germany problem, where they are producing increasingly more sophisticated weapon systems instead of producing more and perhaps more necessary weapon systems that are good enough, rather than superfluous to demands. And speaking of massively superfluous to demands, I introduce to you the XV-104 Riptide. This absolutely massive penis compensating machine stands at twice the size of an XVA's crisis suit and carries about three times as much weaponry, and it is actually capable of jet propulsed flight. Because, well, it is so bloody massive that they could fit quite literally an aircraft engine, or more correctly, two of them, into its backside. It is also rather ridiculously heavily armoured, quite easily capable of withstanding even dedicated anti-tank weapons. As one would probably assume from just the sheer look of the giant, massive, horrible, boomy bang thing, this thing is designed specifically to deal with the more uncomfortable aspects of the Imperial Army, super heavy tanks, knights, dreadnoughts and the likes that normal battlesuits find a fair bit uncomfortable to deal with. The XV-104 is capable of using its agility and superior firepower to get around these massive hulking brutish weapons uh, firepower and therefore avoid the worst that they can throw of them, while also bringing to bear their own weapons against the weaker side, rear and top armor of these vehicles. In particular, it is designed to counter Imperial Knights, which proved to be 
a very uncomfortable surprise for XV-8 battlesuit pilots, as the knights are not only fairly maneuverable by, uh, well, Imperial standards, but also packed enough firepower and protection to almost completely be able to ignore the XV-8s. However, they are most certainly not able to ignore the XV-104. This thing is, in fact, so heavy that it's even capable of withstanding brief periods of exposure to Imperial Titan weaponry. Granted, Light Scout Titan weaponry are on the level of a Warhound Titan, but nevertheless, the Riptide Shield generators are considerably improved over the earlier versions that were... Uh, rather clunky and not particularly stable. However, they do have one rather interesting little feature to them. You see, the Riptide is powered by a rather large fusion reactor. However, this alone is not quite enough to give it the level of maneuverability and power it requires. As such, it also has a highly experimental Nova Reactor, a dark matter energy source. Now, if you know anything about dark matter, you know that that is probably a very, very bad idea to use it as an energy source, and you would be correct, and it is only used for a very, very short period of times at anything even remotely close to full power. It is essentially ticking away at about 1% effectiveness or something, and even that is enough to boost the Riptide into, well, effectiveness, so to say, from a clumbersome, clunky behemoth to something that is almost as agile as an XV-8. But of course, there is the slight problem that any energy source that runs off dark matter tends to be ever so slightly volatile, and... Uh, yeah, if this thing gets hit and destroyed, well... Yeah, the, not only will the Riptide Battlesuit itself simply just cease to exist, but a considerable portion of the nearby area is going to be going away, so... Um, not the safest of vehicles, but uh, certainly impressive to look at. But I mentioned Titans, didn't I? Now, you might, as I have, been thinking before the release of the newer Tau Codex Elite, how the hell would the Tau Empire actually deal with Titans? And in fact, during the Damocles Gulf Crusade, they didn't actually really deal with Titans. They had very, very few ways of dealing with Titans effectively. Essentially, what they ended up doing was using super heavy bombers to try and deal with the Titans, and sadly, this was not particularly effective. It, um, it could keep them in check, certainly, but it was not an effective countermeasure, and it also meant bringing very large and very valuable aircraft, and sometimes even starships, close enough to a Titan for it to be firing back, which is not ideal. So to deal with this, and to deal with Imperial Knights, the Tau developed two very, very large battlesuits. The first of which is the XV-128 Storm Surge, the very first super heavy Tau battlesuit. Now, even calling the Storm Surge a battlesuit is it almost feels like it's not entirely correct, because the battlesuit is a highly mobile, at least for the most uh, cases, weapon system. The Storm Surge is not mobile. In fact, it is usually transported to the battlefield by a specifically modified Tau Manta, a, a, essentially a carrier aircraft. It would perhaps be more fitting to refer to the Storm Surge as a super heavy weapons platform. It is designed specifically as a Imperial Titan killer created by the Earth cast engineer O Ishuru Run after the Tau forces were frequently being outmatched by Imperial Titans and to a slightly lesser degree super heavy tanks. The KV-128 was the first of the Tau's new generation of heavy artillery assets. Now, some Tau sources have named these so-called ballistic suits rather than battle suits, and honestly, I do kind of like that, uh, you know, description better, but, uh, well, 
technically you could argue for both points of view. Though I personally do consider it quite telling that whereas normal Tau battlesuits have uh, jet thrusters to allow it to maneuver, the Storm Surge have jet thrusters to help it compensate for the ridiculous recoil from its main battery weapon. In fact, it even has specific ground spikes that will be fired into the ground to help stabilize it. If it did not have these, and it did not have the thruster systems, the thing would simply tip over from firing its massive primary armament. A further argument for classifying it as essentially a tank rather than a battlesuit is that it is operated not actually by battlesuit pilots, but by a selected pair of veteran hammerhead Grantigrav tank pilots. Now, one of these is essentially the pilot whose primary objective is to keep the thing steady while it is being fired, and the secondary crew member, of course, operates uh, the weapons. Now, the storm surges are, of course, not very maneuverable, and this is a problem seeing as uh, Tau warfare is highly maneuverable. This often means that the storm surge is going to have to look after itself, which is why it is equipped with a wide variety of secondary weapon systems, primarily used to protect the storm surge from, um, you know, enemies that might want to, I don't know, kill it or something because, you know, it's large and scary. These weapons include two cluster rocket system pods, four destroyer missiles, two air bursting fragmentation projectors, two smart missile systems, two burst cannons, and a twin linked flamer, just in case something gets really, really close. Now, the obvious disadvantage aside of the simple fact that once this thing is stationary, it is going to be remaining stationary for a considerable amount of time, which makes it quite vulnerable to uh, counter battery fire. It has one extremely large drawback that it shares with the Riptide. It is ludicrously expensive to produce and requires absurd quantities of very very rare materials. This is a very large problem, especially for uh, the Storm Surge, as it has a very slow to fire weapon. Now you might be wondering, well, why is that relevant? Why are these two, uh, you know, bad things? Well, the thing is, it is a Titan kill. However, Titans usually have void shields. These heavy tower weapons are usually quite capable of knocking through one or two void shields, however, after doing so, they don't have a whole lot of oomph left, which means that you require multiple storm surges to reliably take down a titan before it takes down the storm surge, as, of course, after it has fired, it requires a considerable amount of time to recharge its weapons, and, um, well, you can be pretty damn assured that an Imperial Titan is not going to be giving it the leisure time to do so. As such, you require two or more Storm Surges to focus fire on a single Titan. However, they do have an advantage in the fact that, compared to a Titan, a Storm Surge is relatively small, which means that it can be maneuvered into position, hopefully, without the Titan noticing. So, essentially, if you get a unit of four Storm Surges into position, you could potentially even take down something along the lines of a Warlord Titan by three out of the four collapsing its Void Shield with the final Storm Surge keeping its gun ready to fire until the Void Shields are down and then hitting one of the Titan's primary and most important components, like, for example, the the command bridge or the primary reactor, therefore hopefully killing it before it is capable of locating the storm surges and giving them the good news. And then finally we come to the KX-139 Taunar Supremacy Armor. Now this one is quite interesting because it is the first battle suit or ballistic suit, if you would so choose to call it, then is designed not for offensive purposes. It is in fact the very first Super Heavy, or even Battlesuit in general, that was designed as a defensive measure rather than an offensive measure. Because the Tau Empire has over the course of their history now realized that 
There are some really nasty things out there in the deep, dark space, including orcs, tyranids, and the Imperium, and, well, they haven't really run into chaos properly yet, so I'm sure they'll find that downright amusing when they get around to fighting demons and chaos space marines. But the basic point of this unit is that it should be equipped to deal with virtually anything thrown at it, because, of course, when you are a defensive platform, you know, you have some limitations. You can't really be expected to transport these things from planet to planet and therefore, you know, arm them specifically to counter whatever it is likely to face, so it needs to be armed to counter pretty much anything. And in this respect, it is armed with three large Pulse Ordnance multi-drivers on its backs for extreme long-range artillery fire, firing blobs of plasma over extreme range. It also includes triple ion cannons with a fusion eradicator on each arm. These are essentially high-energy laser weapons, an ion weapon is designed for uh, point defense, and two chest-mounted stations known as the Vigilance Defense System with burst cannons and missile pods intended for close-range defense against uh, enemy infantry forces, orcs, tyranny little ones, etc., while it uses its uh, Pulse Ordnance multi-drivers to take care of large enemy threats, although they do struggle with void-shielded opponents like Titans. They do have to rely on their um, cousins to take care of that kind of stuff, but as for giant Tyranid bioconstructs or Orc Gargants, it is a very nice weapon, because Orc Gargants void shields can usually be overwhelmed by the sheer volume of fire that its ordnance drives are capable of punking out, and, uh, well, orcs are not known quite for the effectiveness of their shielding to the point of Imperial Titans. On the other hand, it has proven itself a remarkably efficient Warhound Titan killer, as it is capable of firing quickly enough, but still have enough firepower to cause significant damage to these relatively lightly shielded Scout Titans. Additionally, it is protected by a barrier shield generator, the heaviest mobile shield generator available to the Tau Empire, which is capable of withstanding Titan-class weaponry for limited amounts of time. For example, it'll probably withstand a direct hit by a plasma blast gun, but it's going to be struggling against a Vulcan Megabolter. Essentially anything that is capable of sustained fire is going to be a problem. Nevertheless, the Taunar Supremacy Armor is an interesting split, I suppose you should say, from traditional Tau tactics. It is clearly far more of a defensive measure than previous defensive measures like uh, draw, um, sorry, drone-controlled towers, which are essentially just fixed position gun turrets, rather than this, which is a mobile platform. Not incredibly mobile, it does not have a jetpack system, but it is capable of walking and capable of getting across fairly rough terrain, and therefore it is also of course capable of getting into cover. So it's a very interesting little critter, this, that has, like I said, a very fascinating use for such a um, offensively minded faction where pretty much everything is supposed to be mobile. This is a very interesting look into the Tau mentality, the fact that they have essentially, they've come to terms with the fact that the galaxy is not the open and welcoming place they had originally thought it to be, and they are more and more getting ready to meet a variety of threats, which is again a wonderful example of just how good the Tau are at evolving and adapting to changing circumstances. So, with that 15-minute uh, odd rant, I am ending the video on Tau battle suits there. There are a few suits I have not talked about, like, for example, the extremely experimental single-man pilot battlesuit, but um, it's not really a battlesuit as far as I'm concerned, it's more along the lines of an advancement over the normal combat armor, so I think I'll be happy with this one. So, until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you soon.
Have a good day.